come on in everyone come on in because we are here y'all we are here for love is blind season seven episode seven eight and nine all of them y'all the second the second set i'm doing them all at one time i originally was only gonna do one episode then i was like okay let me watch the second episode and once i watched the second episode i just had to watch the third one because so much was going on y'all so much was going on what a shocker what a shocker i'm just i'm overwhelmed y'all i'm overwhelmed as you can see as everybody can see i'm in my pajamas i'm in my pajamas because um i barely <laughs> i should be like a lot of these women um i can't get out of bed um so I said, you know what? I'm just going to do this video in my pajamas because uh, that's how I'm feeling right now. Like I don't want to get out of my pajamas because what a letdown. I'm so mad at Love is Blind. I am so mad as love, at Love is Blind. Um, but we're going to go through this. We're going to go through it and we're going to talk about all the stuff. Taylor, um... Ashley, Tyler, not Tyler, not Taylor. Taylor's doing well. Tyler, Ashley, Ramsey's, Maritza, Marissa's mama, um, Hannah and Nick, uh, old boy over there, Steven, and Monica. So much to talk about, y'all. I don't even know where to begin. I don't know where to begin, but snuggle up. Get yourself something to drink that you want to drink at this moment of the hour whenever you're watching this video but for everybody who made it to the premiere hey y'all hey y'all to everyone who made it to the premiere thank you for coming thank you for dropping down in the chat don't forget to say hello um don't forget to do a thumbs up on the video like the video um subscribe to the video or not subscribe to the video subscribe to my channel if you like my content because I'm trying to put out more content, y'all, to have more variety for different type of people because we don't all watch the same type of shows. So hopefully you're appreciating some of that. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. You know, y'all, before I get to the stuff that just breaks my heart, can we at least just talk about the stuff that's going well? You know, they, sometimes they ask you, I got some news for you. I got good news and I got bad news. And um, they say, which news do you want to hear face? What type of person are you guys when they say, what news do you want to hear first when they say good news or bad news? And I always say, give me the good news first because I don't know how I'm going to feel after I hear the bad news. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to feel after I'm hearing the bad news because then I may not be able to really receive the good news. So give me the good news first. So we're going to go with the good news first, y'all. Um, you all may not be like me, but y'all got to help me through. Like I said, I'm in my pajamas today, y'all. My pajamas. I ain't never come on no YouTube in my pajamas. <laughs> you know, it's a sad day. It's a sad day when I show up in my pajamas. But um, first of all, let's talk about Taylor and Garrett. You know, when we started seeing the episodes from seven on in, they were wrapping up their honeymoons in Mexico. And based on the conversation that Taylor and Garrett had, they even ha they haven't had sex. So they're they're probably the only couple that didn't have sex in Mexico because Taylor's still talking about thank you for going at her pace so that it can feel real and authentic to her. So they haven't had sex. That's my guess. That they what do y'all think? Do you think that they've had sex in Mexico? I don't think that they have. Now we get back to um real life well it's not really real life yet because they're going to go live in this apartment that netflix has set them up in and it looks like it's a nice apartment with a nice city view and taylor's i need to see your instagram <laughs> she's like let's get to the real stuff you do when you really dating a person and that is i want to see your instagram or social media profiles and he said that's fine you can look at it let me tell you something um let me tell you something taylor um garrett is a physicist um why would you think he'd leave his instagram unscrubbed <laughs> he ain't like ashley he ain't like alex who didn't clean up her room mm -mm, talking about she didn't have no time no garrett had time to clean his uh instagram even if he needed to to clean it i don't even think he needed to clean it 
But if he did need to clean it, he cleaned it before he came on the show because he's a physicist. He's going to think things out. And he absolutely cleaned it. And we, and we know for sure Taylor cleaned hers because Taylor is a planner. She's thorough. She thinks way ahead. So if anything, we can say that he said, nope, ain't nothing on my Instagram, social media. All you're going to see on there is me catching fish. Spear fishing, that's it. It's going to be dull and boring, and you're not going to get nothing from it. I wish a few other people would have taken a page from Garrett's book and kept it dull and boring. But no, everybody else, everybody else had to spice it up and put some hot sauce on it. Because <laughs> we're going to get to some of these other couples, and they did not tone their stuff down. They ramped it up. So, um, like, like Gary said, there was nothing really on there for, for Taylor to have any suspicion. And then next thing you know, we ride and go into Fredericksburg to where, um, Garrett's parents' house live. And, um, we're going to meet the parents. And that mama's tore up. That mama, I, you know, I understand the mama. She's scared for her son. She is scared for her son and she's so scared that she can't contain herself. She's crying She's like, I don't want to get my kid hurt. I mean, it's something about no matter how old your kids get, <laughs> you still scared. You still scared for them. And she's scared for her son, Garrett. He's a whole physicist. He's so logical. He's so, you know, a lot of things they talk about is our family and our friends are going to have to trust our decision making. We know that they're scared because when you look at it on the outside, you see, oh, I just met a person. I'm getting married all within 15 days. But what they're saying is, I really want you to trust our judgment. And the one thing I like that Garrett did when he introduced Taylor to his family was he was pumping her up. He knew that his parents would want to know, is this woman that Garrett met of any substance? Because our, our son is of deep substance. And so he made sure to tell her, no, she's a chemistry major. Oh, no, she's got a master's from John Hopkins. Taylor wasn't even going to necessarily bring it up. It didn't look like she wasn't going to leave with her accomplishments or her degrees or all these other kind of things. But it was Garrett who said, I want to make sure that my parents know that Taylor ain't no snuff. She ain't just no, she ain't just any old body. She got it going on and I'm going to make sure that they know she got it going on. And he told them, he said, listen, uh-uh. No, this girl is of substance and I'm not just on here getting with someone because all of a sudden I just, you know, fell in love. This is a thoughtful type of love. You know, we use the phrase, oh, I fell in love as if we didn't have any control over it. Like we tripped on a, we tripped on the sidewalk and then we, next thing we knew we fell down and next thing we knew we were swimming in love. Love should be thoughtful. And I think what Gary was trying to point out to his parents was, no, this is thought out. It may be quick to you. It may feel like it's not being thought out, but it's being thought out. And I want you to know that I thought about everything. I ran my numbers in my head. I ran my calculations. And let me tell you something. She's the one for me. She is the one for me. And he's in love. He is deeply in love with her because he's saying to himself that he's willing to move away from his parents and his family to San Diego to be with her. At first, I was like, dang, Taylor, why are you springing this on him like this? You met in Virginia, but you want him to move to California? But come to find out, they had these conversations in the pods. So I was happy to see that Taylor didn't all of a sudden just spring on him this new desire to live in California. That's a long way away. California to Virginia is a long way away. That's not a, that's not a commute you make every month or every other month. So Garrett's concern that they would have kids and then maybe not see the grandparents could be a valid concern. But let me tell you, he is in to Taylor and he's like, that's okay. If it comes down to me leaving my parents, I'm going to leave and cleave. I'm going to leave and cleave. I'm going to leave my parents. And I'm going to cleave to my wife and start our new family and start new things. And oftentimes that's what you find here in California. I was born and raised in California, but there are a lot of people who moved to California. And so what you tend to find in California, you find a lot of the Garrett's of the world. People who left their family way behind. Oh, I'm really from New York. I'm from Chicago. I'm from here. I moved to California. So they often don't have a lot of family and friends. They don't have the deep roots in California or in LA like I have. So they often find how hard it is to make friends. So that's why sometimes the best way when people move to California is to move with 
your family, your partner, your husband, your wife, and then build your family in California because a lot of people don't have family in California. Most people, when you walk around, they move to California. California is built on a lot of transplants, a lot of transplants. But if any couple can make it in California with the high cost of living, including San Diego, it's going to be Garrett and Taylor because they're going to make enough money to make it in San Diego. San Diego is one of the highest cost counties, San Diego County in California. There's only three, L.A. County, Orange County, and San Diego County, which are the biggest, the, the most expensive counties in California. And um, it's, it's, it is as expensive as, you know, New York or Boston or places like that. So, but you know what? You could tell he's into Taylor because he's decided he's going to move. He's okay with it. He's okay raising kids there. But that mama of Garris was tore up. She was tore up. And I know she ain't taking the news well that he's thinking of moving to San Diego because he said he didn't really want to share the private conversations he's had with his mother to Taylor because he doesn't want Taylor to get the impression that the parents don't like Taylor. The parents are just concerned about him leaving the entire family. And Taylor says, I want to protect. Gary said she, he wanted to protect Taylor. Garrett is protecting Taylor a lot. He loves this girl. He loves her a lot. And you know what? Their fun, friendly bantering that they had when he went to go see her apartment and he was kind of cracking a few jokes on how empty her refrigerator was and cracking a few jokes over how she had a bunch of solo cups in the house. <laughs> I thought it was really I thought it was really funny, but it also makes me double down on who I think Taylor is. I think Taylor is going to have to get out of her shell of being a little bit um she definitely going to have to get more into the nurturing. She's going to have to tap into her nurturing side a little bit more. She talked a lot about her independence this season, about why she wanted to delay having children. Um, and we see a lot of independence in her. We see a lot of living alone. She doesn't look like she's she was that much a person who likes to cook. Or she doesn't look like she wants to have too much of that kind of stuff. Which is okay because I don't think that uh, Garrett is this traditional person. I think he's more progressive. It looks like he's, he owns his own company. He talked about he can move and they can buy him out. He got a lot going on and he says they both have a lot busy schedule. And I think he likes that about Taylor. But inevitably, inevitably, I know Taylor probably doesn't see it now. Inevitably, when they do have children and he and Garrett will be just as much a participant in that children, I hope Taylor isn't thinking that everything will be 50 50 with the children because sometimes it isn't even up to the father sometimes the children just want to cling to the mother so sometimes women think it's their choice that hey when we have children and housework and all this it's going to be 50 50 you have the kids 50 i'll have the kids it's joint it's not going to be this whole patriarchal society where i do all the work as a woman i do all the cooking and cleaning but sometimes there's a little wrench that gets thrown in and that's what the children want. And sometimes early on, the children just want to be with the mom because they were in the mama's womb. So sometimes it takes a bit for that child to start wanting to. That just depends on how the mother is. But I, 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 want, I really hope Taylor comes down to that conclusion because I do see this part of Taylor whereby... Um, She's definitely willing to ask for the things she wants to be happy. She's really good. I want to move to San Diego. I want to do this. I don't want to have kids to this time. I want this. I just hope that Taylor can compromise on things because right now I do see Garrett doing a lot of the big compromising. And it's so ironic because initially I thought that Garrett was not going to be that guy. And here he is turning out to be that guy. I really, really love this situation and what else I liked about them be honest with you was when the whole thing dropped with Monica and Steven and how not only was Taylor consoling Monica Garrett came along and helped console Monica too I really really loved it and I really 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 love that about them I'm just high on these two I'm really really high on these two I hope they make it I hope the meeting with Taylor's mom goes well she looks like she might be a little bit of a hard nose but i hope she can stand up to her mother i hope that she, she'll be able to stand up to her mother and i think it's still going to be a yes i'm still going with a yes for these two i feel very very confident that it's going to be a yes in the high percentage marks i feel like this is going to be a yes 
I feel like any reservations that they might have is not going to be enough to tell them no. They're going to go for it. They're going to do it. And they're going to try to work through their problems as they go along. I don't see why not. I don't see enough red flags with these two for them to say no. And so I'm going to go say yes. Yes, it's going to be a yes. Now, like I said, I was giving... I was giving kudos to Garrett and Taylor, how they consoled Monica. So let's talk a little bit about Monica and Steven. Good Lord. Good Lord. Um, first of all, in episode seven, we started off talking, Monica, talking about all of these flowers. Get me flowers. Get me flowers. Get me flowers. I'm going to say this. Um, I'm not a fan of Monica, and I'm definitely not a fan of Steven. Um, but I'm not a fan of Monica. So when I say I'm in my pajamas and I'm torn up, I'm not really torn up over Monica and Steven. I'm not going to lie. I really don't care because I don't really, not only do I, I'm not really into either one of them individually, I'm not even into them as a couple. So it's almost like, oh, Monica and Steven broke up. Oh, okay. Whatever. Whatever, girl, Monica and Steven broke up. Um, because there's a part of me about both of them that I, I didn't like parts I didn't like parts of their personality. And when in the beginning, Monica was really driving me crazy with this, I need to get you, you need to get me flowers, you need to get me flowers, you need to get me flowers. Actions speak louder than words. I mean, she was talking this stuff when they were still in Mexico. I mean, I don't know. Did she want flowers delivered to the room? What is Monica talking about with these flowers? It's like constantly over and over again. And then she says, um, you know what? I know I told you my, my um, love language were words of affirmation and acts of service, but it, all, it also want a gift too. Well, girl, just say they are all of them are your <laughs> love languages. Typically, when we talk about love language, we all like maybe a little bit of everything, but we typically frame it in what's your biggest one? What's your number one thing or your number two thing? In Monica's world, she wants all of it. She wants you to give her words of affirmation, which we know it. Like I said, she needs constant validation. She then wants you to constantly do things for her. Get me water. Get my slippers. Do this for me. Do that for me. Now she's on at, Now she's on gifts. Give me some flowers every single day of my life. Ugh, uh, uh, Monica, I really don't know who you're for, Monica. If I'm matchmaking out in the world, Monica, I don't know who's for you. Because any guy that falls at your feet and does everything you want and becomes like your slave You'll probably be mad at him because he won't have the type of money that you want. He won't be able to buy you that YSL bag you're talking about or the Louis Vuitton bag. And I'm um, here. You have Steven over here talking about who is he? <laughs> who is he? First, he said Kate Spade and she said, don't buy me no Kate Spade bag. <laughs> That's too low end. That's only a hundred dollar bag. I need a YSL or Louis Vuitton bag. She said, I'm happy that you wrote me poems. You gave me good words of affirmation, but I need gifts too. I need flowers, 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 flowers. And um, already he's talking about how he feels overwhelmed. Stephen don't like Monica. I said in the last video, Stephen doesn't like Monica. And we were wondering why he was playing along just so he can be on TV. We knew Monica didn't like him either. What are they doing? I felt like Monica was doing it just so she could be on TV, not be on TV, just so she can have a man that proposed to her. And now we find out, I guess she just wanted some things. I don't know. Um, and then he says he's feeling overwhelmed by all these demands of Monica. Monica has this sar sarcastic way of speaking. You know, when they were meeting everybody for the last night and they were doing the fireworks and and um, Stephen went off and talked to Garrett. And when the fireworks came on, you notice he didn't even want to leave talking to Garrett. Later on, he lied, y'all. Did you hear the lie from Stephen when he said, oh, we were having a serious conversation and I didn't want to break off what Garrett was saying because he was having a moment. Almost as if it was Garrett having a problem. But I don't think Garrett was having a problem. I think Stephen was having a problem. I think Stephen was venting to Garrett about his issues with Monica because they were having issues. Now, I know Monica wants to say every couple of hours, I love you. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. But let's be real. She was struggling with Garrett. There were struggles in this relationship. So all of a sudden now she's like, oh, how romantic the fireworks were. <laughs> she's sarcastic. She's okay. And then, she's, and then she goes and tells her girls, oh, he's so scared of me. He's so scared of me, but I'm not effing around with him anymore. 
Girl, Monica, why are you still here? This is why I didn't care when they broke up. I didn't care because they were never right from each other from the beginning. Both of them were never right in their, they're not right in their own right and they're not right together. So I did not care that they broke up. You know, and then all of a sudden you have, you start to hear these little things about Stephen talking about, well, you know, there's home records out there in the world. And when we get back, there's going to be home records dipping it, you know, dipping and diving in our DMs, talking about they want to uh, suck our Ds and all this other kind of stuff. Why are you talking about this? Not only talking about it to me, I'm your fiance, but why are you even talking about it to your friends? These are very, 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 very weird flags because he starts later on talking about all kinds of stuff, anal sex, preggers, et, uh, you know, sucking D by women in the street. You know, and later on we find out, yeah, this guy's got some type of weird sex fetishes and stuff. It's a whole lot more going on with Steven. Now we know why Steven is with Monica. Because Monica is a fetish for Steven. Let's say, I don't always think interracial, interracial relationships are because of fetishes. But I'm going to tell you that this one is. This one is a fetish. This was a one of Steven saying, ooh, I get to see what a black vagina looks like. Like Monica said last, last before she goes, it is nice to have a man that's so into a vagina. He's into it because he ain't never had a black one. He's like, what is this? Pink on the inside, dark on the outside. I want to see this difference. That's what he's into. It's the fetish of it all. He, he, it's just, ugh. I can't, it's nasty. It's gross. It's horrible. And even when they're getting ready to leave Mexico, and he's packing his luggage and Monica's in the bed. She's like, come in here and get in the bed with me and hold me until I can fall asleep. Ugh. Who wants to be with Monica? Well, I mean, we know don't nobody want to be with Steven. That's why he's too busy watching porn on TV and stuff. But who wants to be with Monica? No one. No one wants this. No man's going to want this. So she may, she may think she got out of this looking like the better person, but she really doesn't. Monica has got a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do. Steven got a whole lot of work to do as well. His stuff is just gross. Just, just gross. Even when they're talking about later on, Monica was talking about her dad doesn't even want to come on camera. Doesn't want to be seen on camera. She already knew she wasn't going to say yes to this man in the long run. Because we know find out he done lost his job. He lost his job. He came home and lost his job. So you didn't square away with your job going away. He just left. And then it comes back and talk about, do I still have a job? And they're like, no, you ain't heard. You've been fired. You are no call, no show for all these weeks and you coming back. So he's irresponsible. He left his job in that kind of way. And he thinking he going to come back and have a job. Nah. Now he's an electrician. So he probably, he probably can find a job anywhere. Like he said, the longest he ever been unemployed is a week. So he can easily find a job. But let me tell you, but after Monica found out he didn't have a job and he doing all, he ain't watching fireworks and he ain't bringing flowers, Monica stopped sleeping with Steven. And she said, I'm not sleeping with you because now I got reservations. The minute Steven started backtracking on wanting to get married, Monica closed up the cookie shop. She closed it up. And she says, no, I'm not doing that anymore because I don't even know if you want to move forward in this marriage. And Steven was like, that's fine. You ain't got to do it. Because I can sit over here and have phone sex and, and text some naked sexy pictures and do all kind of stuff with women on the with women on the phone. And that's what he started doing. <laughs> that he picked right up where he left off. He said, That's fine, Monica. You don't want to sleep with me no more. Then I go over here and do what I need to do. And she over here talking about, yeah, but you're gonna have to work on these um these stabs in the in the back of my butt all night long. A hard penis. Because he's freak. He's a freaky deaky. He got issues. He, he acts like he's a 14, 15 year old boy. Uh, uh, uh. He's obsessed with the vagina, okay? He's absolutely obsessed, and one ain't gonna be enough for him. One vagina for Steven is not gonna be enough. He's gonna need a lot of them, a whole lot of them. A black one, a white one, a, 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 all different types of colors pink, brown, <laughs> everything. I can't believe he said he went to a sleep center. <laughs> And that's where he was drunk texting. Wait a minute. A sleep center is where they go and evaluate you, I believe, for like sleep apnea. When you, store, when you snore a lot, they measure your sleep patterns. So how could you show up to a sleep center where they're going to be hooking you up to machines and you come in intoxicated and drunk? <laughs> oh, 
oh, one of them women's houses must have turned into a sleep center. He didn't even come home? Please. Please. But the breakup of all breakup, Monica said, was, that's fine, we breaking up. Venmo me my money. <laughs> Venmo me my money. Run me my money. Run me my money that I have to had to have given you over the last few days. So let me get this right. Why are you having to give Steven money? You mean to tell me that he didn't have no money saved for this show. So he did this show without any money saved up to pay his bills. So now he's broke and you had to loan him money, please. Monica wasn't going to say yes to this man. If she already was having to loan him money, he ain't got no money for no flowers. He ain't got no money for no YSL back. He ain't got no money for none of this. And now he's sexting and texting and he ain't, he ain't showing up for fireworks, please. But like I said, I do not care because I don't like Monica and I do not like Steven. So next, next. The next couple we got to talk about is we got to talk about Marissa and Ramsey's. Now, anybody that's been watching my videos, I said what I said about Marissa. She's a chameleon. You don't know who she is because she's a chameleon. And what we saw in this episode 789 was a chameleon in the works and how long she's been a chameleon. But now we know where it came from. That mama, that mama is hell on wheels. That mama is hell on wheels. So we know where it came from. But Marissa is absolutely a chameleon. And this is why she gets in trouble dating. Because Marissa wants to be a whole lot of things. And all the things she wants to be. Um, she doesn't say who she is. And then she finds people that don't really want what she is. So Marissa is a Navy girl. Like she says. She's a, a fun girl. So before they leave Mexico. They get to go out on the, on the yacht. On the boat. Have a good time. And... Um, they talk a lot about what their wedding is going to look like. She starts calling Ramsey's. He's going to be a bridezilla. And then she goes, ooh, I mean a groomzilla. No, you got it right the first time. Because Marissa really does want to turn Ramsey into a bridezilla, a bride. That's who Marissa really wants to turn Ramsey into. Let me tell you, Marissa would make a horrible husband. I said it right. A horrible husband. Because when you think of like roles in a family, they're not traditional, but Marissa wants to be the role of the man. She wants to be able to go to work, not be the primary caregiver, not have to cook, not have to clean, make all the decisions. She wants her career to come first over the career of the man's. Um, and then what she wants to do is she probably wants to also be able to flirt with other uh, women or men, just like a, just like. People can accuse men of these men who are protectors and providers and they have a lot of or they have money or they're going to make money. They feel that they should have all these other liberties in the relationship because they are making the money. So they want the woman to cook, clean, raise the kids, follow whatever beliefs they have, follow them, follow their careers. Right. And then they feel like they could they don't have any rules on them or whether or not they can flirt with other people. That's Marissa. Marissa would make for a horrible husband. She's that guy that a lot of women get rid of. But she don't even see that about herself. Anyway, let me keep going. So first of all, she says she want a wedding with all black on. Um, I'm not saying nothing's wrong with it. I've, seen, I've gone to weddings where that was the theme. And I'm not saying anything was wrong with it. When it's at night and it's like a really late night wedding and the wedding doesn't start till like 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. It can feel like a black tie affair, so it can have a, a thing to it. But if they're not getting married at night and they're getting married in the middle of the day, it does look a bit weird. It typically looks really nice when it's a night wedding. I've been to those. They look very, it is pretty. But um, she's pretty clear that she wants to play both the male and female roles. So what she tells Ramsey is, no, I want to control what we wear at the wedding. So in this role, I want to play the female where I get to pick what the wedding is. But the problem is you're picking a man who you want to be more like the female in the relationship. And now you're even taking away his female rights. <laughs> you like, you like, I only, I want Ramsey to be the female. Plus I want him to hang a TV and fix stuff. Girl, you want the whole thing. We come to find out. Yes. Marissa probably needs to be with like, um, someone who goes both ways, like a bisexual person, because she loves the male and female all in one. 
she's attracted to male female roles all in one person and um, as they start talking about this wedding even more and more you start to hear a bit about what her beliefs are um, but I guess Marissa is in lives in Baltimore and this and this whole thing is taking place in DC so right now she's having a commute two hours to get to where they're staying in the apartment two hours is a long time a two-hour commute four hours on the road every single day and she's like I can't do this you're gonna you're gonna need to end up moving to Baltimore there you go move for my career ain't nothing wrong with it it's nothing wrong with it. I'm just trying to point out to you that Marissa is the man she's a husband she's she wants to talk about a patriarchal society this is what's so ironic about Marissa. She wants to beat down a patriarchal society that I don't like a society where the man is in charge and in control. But really what Marissa is creating is she's creating the exact same dynamics, but she's in control. So the very thing she's complaining about men like to do, move for my career, move for me. She's doing it, but she's just a woman. What difference does it make? What difference does it make, Marissa? You're actually... You're actually going along with the same things you fight against. You're becoming that same person just because you're a woman and you do it doesn't make it any better. But anyway, he talk, he says, you know what? Can you cook? He says he can cook. She's like, good, because I don't really like to cook. And then they have these little noodles. And she's talking about, oh, these noodles sure are hard. They're a la dente. He goes, is that how you pronounce it? She goes, yeah, a la dente. Girl, that's not how you pronounce it. <laughs> That's not, it's not called al dente. It's al dente. It's not al dente. Woo! This girl, I tell you, now she's running around acting like she knows everything and she doesn't. Once again, another trait of a man who makes a bad husband, a man who thinks he knows everything and he doesn't. I'm telling you, she makes for a bad husband. And then she's like, yeah, and when we do get married, I want my fishing. She definitely can't be no male. Man, Marissa, what, 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 how did you get here to you? <laughs> I'm starting to believe you hate men, Marissa. But once again, when we get to that mama, we're going to be able to see why she may hate men so much. Because obviously, that mama has been with, has kids by five different men. And some of these views also came from that mama. So then Marissa said, yeah, not only do I not want a man to marry me, I don't even want no cis hetero. <laughs> Girl. Why is Marissa out here pretending she's one person and she's a whole nother person? Why doesn't she just come out with all this stuff? Why doesn't she just tell people up front who she really, really is so she can find a person who will want to be with her? You know why? Because it's going to be hard to find a male who wants to be with Marissa. Marissa's going to need to go find maybe a female body person and then something else i don't know what i don't there's so many different definitions of what of what who marissa needs to be with but i'm telling you who she needs to be with is not a heterosexual let me just say this because i don't know all these definitions out here anymore there are so many of them but what she doesn't need to be with is a male heterosexual she needs something completely different maybe some of you down in there can tell me who she needs to be with and now we start getting into some of this other stuff i guess marissa was part of the Mormon community at some point in time. And now she that's a lot of part of where she has this, you know, pushback on religion because the Mormon community it is a strong religion. They do govern a lot of parts of your life. So now oftentimes you do see people who've come out of the Mormon religion really revolt against the religion. But yet you also find people in the religion who find safety and comfort. I will mimic what she said when she said a lot of Mormon people are really nice and they're very giving. I do believe that because I think that's also a really big cornerstone of their, um, a really big cornerstone of their religion. Not only family having lots of children for their reasons, but also giving, tithing. A lot of it is really embedded in, the, in their religion and they have to really stick to it. And so I could see how maybe she felt confined by that. So maybe this is part of why she wants to rebel. So, you know, Ramsey's over here talking about he was born in a church. And when I, he was born in the church, he was in the ministry. And we find out, finally, we find out that Ramsey is from Venezuela. He was born in Venezuela. And there was a lot of, of course, we know there's a lot of strife in Venezuela. And then he moved here. I want to know when Ramsey moved here. I, I think he was young when he moved here. I wonder if he moved here through like some type of asylum program. 
Because when they started getting into this whole military thing, I was just shocked by Ramsey's. I mean, I actually even had a problem with Ramsey's conversation, especially given that I think Ramsey might have come here in some sort of asylum type of thing. And the views that he was having, I'm going to tell you, against the United States, I understand that war, um, all our wars are not popular wars. I was not for all the wars that the United States had. But the conversation that Ramsey's was having with, with um, Maritza regarding her service in the military was disturbing to me. It was very disturbing to me. And what I can't understand is why Marissa would even want to be with Ramsey's. Like I said, a chameleon, a chameleon. How can you be with a man who hates something that was such a big part of your life and still is a big part of your life? Not only is he saying, oh, I could never go to the military. What he's saying is he kind of has a disdain for people who did go. He looks down on them. You know, I had a real problem with Ramsey's. I mean, um, I come from a family where people served in the military. My father served in the military, not his whole life, but he did like four years in the army. Um, so he was down a lifelong military person. I married to a man whose father served lifelong in the military, 35 years in the armed services. My, 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 my husband is, what do you call a military brat? You know, he was an arm first. He lived all around the world. He traveled. And to hear Ramsey speak the way he did bother me. And it bothered me coming from a person who immigrated to the United States. That even further bothered me that you want to talk about the United States, but yet you immigrated here and found a safe space. I understand that you can disagree with some of the politics of wars with the United States. That part I don't have a problem with. You, I probably would find common ground with Ramsey's. But the way that he talked bad about Marissa for even having joined the military, I thought was horrible. I thought it was horrible. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with me. But once again, here I am at a crossroads and I'm saying to myself, yeah, as much as I didn't like the conversation with Ramsey's and I'm really turned off by Ramsey's now, um, how do I feel about Maritza? And, my, and I still stand with Maritza that this is part of the problem with Maritza. You know, she in one way was with these military men who are definitely probably more, uh, more, more patriotic or whatever you want to call it. But she didn't like the fact that they probably like to have a more patriotical role and she doesn't want to fall into that category. And then she goes over here and gets with a man who's more, who's more interested in having a more fluid relationship. You know, no, no norms, different types of things. But yet he, he looks down on you for serving your country. And then she tries to say, yeah, at one time I wasn't even going to serve in the, in the, in the arms and the reserve. So one way she was also trying to pretend like she had, oh yeah, I served in the service. But now, you know, afterwards, I don't need to anymore. No girl, you was going to be in the reserve too. You was going to be in the reserves too. And then she's flip-flopping, talking about, I do support the military. I don't support the military, but I support the people who are in the military. I support military families. Who the hell are you, Maritza? Who the hell? You for the military, but not for the military, but you support the families, but you was in the military, but you don't really like it. But then you try to sign up for the reserves too. What are you talking about? Who are you? I'm all for people having whatever beliefs you have. Have them. Let me know what, what they are so I can decide if I really want to hang around you. I'm not going to bash you for your beliefs. But what I am going to do is I'm going to take your beliefs and I'm going to figure out, do I want to be with you? No. Do I want to believe? But Marissa, she don't let people know who she really is. She doesn't let people know who she really is. She's a chameleon. She goes over here, meets men, and then she, she forms to what they are, even though she's someone differently. She knew these beliefs of Ramsey's from the very beginning. She knew it. And she hid all these other parts of her, how deeply embedded she is into the military. Then when they get back to the States, now she's starting to expose to him. Listen, I just want you to know I'm deep into the military. I know I didn't want to pretend like I was when we was on, you know, in the pods because I didn't want to scare you off because I already knew what your beliefs were. But now that we back here on dry land, I'm going to have to tell you the truth. I'm deep into the military. Military families, friends, everything. I'm deep into it. Marissa might want to go back and want to be a military lawyer. She might want to go back and do that. When she said, well, what if I went back into the military? And he said, oh, absolutely not. Well, guess what? She talking about she's going to become an attorney, a lawyer. She might, she might be going back to become an attorney or a lawyer going to law school because she wants to go back into the military and be a military lawyer. How about that? 
She said, um, if I go back into the military, what are you going to do? Her friends was like, will you divorce him? He said, yeah, I would divorce you. I believe it. I believe it just like I believe Ramses dated that woman. What? Because she was Christian. Let's look at that story. He said he was deep into the church. He was part of the ministry, right? He was married to a woman in the church and he divorced that woman. Did Ramsey get to the U.S. through some type of Christian type organization? And that's how he got over here because of his ties to a church. And then once, he, and once all this started to happen, all of a sudden now he don't want to have nothing to do with the woman in which he started a, a Christian relationship with. All of a sudden he don't want to be with her no more. Hmm. Hmm. He said he used to be in ministry in the church. Like once again, a couple I don't care about because I don't feel like either one of them are coming to this relationship authentically. I don't care. They're not going to make it to the altar. They're not going to make it to the altar whatsoever. And if they do say yes, it's not going to last. I can see them saying yes, because one thing that they do very well is lie to each other. So will they say no at the altar? Hmm. It's a fit. I don't know. They may not say no at the altar, but I know they won't last. Because one thing I know about these two is they lie to each other and they both tell lies. Ramses is lying about his divorce. Like I said, I want to hear more about it. And now the way I hear Ramses talking right now, I know that that divorce he had with that woman was foul. It was foul. So when this mama got on here and started leaning into Ramses and that mama was foul herself. She said, I'm not really feeling you. I'm not feeling your look with this 80s Jerry curl. I'm like, Call it out, mama. Call it out with this 80s Jerry curl. <laughs> and she called it a tail or something. I call it, like I said, the roach clip. You used, to, you used to attach a roach clip to it. But that mama was something else. That mama got her own issues. Even Marissa later on said, How do you, what do you think about my mama? He said, if I'm ever going to do a family event with you, I'm going to need a little time to get ready for that. <laughs> Don't worry. You ain't going to need no time because y'all ain't going to have no family events. Because like Marissa said, my mama needs therapy. She absolutely needs therapy. When you got five kids by five different men, you need some therapy. You've been through some shit. You have been through this shit. And when you hear that they grew up poor, right? They grew up poor, didn't have anything. You see why Marissa went to the military. A lot of people who go to the military are people who come from families that are probably like Marissa's all over the place. And the, and the military offered them a safe space which is another reason that makes me so mad that the military probably saved Marissa. Probably was a way to save Marissa. That mama said all those kids, she might have had five kids by five different men, but she said every single one of her kids went to college and is college educated. Now that's a success. Now that's a success. She said they were poor, but that mama also went to nursing school. So I guess that mama went on to become a nurse and, um, she had to raise all these kids by herself. And then here you got Ramsey's over here talking about he went to college, but then he dropped out. And that mom was like, I don't like what I'm hearing. So what you going to do? Rely upon her for all her money? <laughs> yeah, and all them government benefits. You go, So let me tell you, you hate the military, but you're willing to sit up there and live off that government pension? Hell to the no. Hell to the no. You want to go to the VA for some medical care. I, be, I bet you want to do that. I bet you want to want the health care, Ramses, that's going to come from all that military service. I bet you're going to want that pension. I bet you're going to want that VA loan to get that house. I bet you're going to take every perk you can from the military, Ramses, but then you're going to talk about the military like a dog. Hell to the no, no, no. But I see where um, Marissa's had to be a chameleon because this mama's off the chain. She called her own mother. She said, my mother thinks I'm evil. And, and my mama said, yeah, uh, she can't be a bitch. What? What kind of mother-daughter conversation is this? What kind of mother-daughter conversation is this? Marissa says her mama needs to go to therapy. So does Marissa. She needs to go unpack all this stuff. This is a hot mess, y'all. This is a hot mess. And Marissa said, yeah, I am bossy. We know you bossy, girl. We know you are bossy. You want to be the, the, the groom? Please. I'm so done with Marissa and Ramsey's. I really am done. I know a lot of people like Marissa. I said from the very beginning, nah, I'm not with Marissa. I'm not, I'm not for Marissa. And um, that mama said, well, you're going to need to get a prenup. And he was like, Marissa ain't even got no money yet, but she will have some. You're going to need to get a prenup. And he said, I don't mind getting a prenup. I know you don't mind getting no prenup and, and sitting over there getting all them government benefits too. Ugh.
Can't stand Ramses. I don't like them. I don't like Ramses. Ramses over here used that first woman for Christianity. Then she, then he talked bad about God. <laughs> now he over here with Maritza living, trying to live up on her government benefits and talking bad about the military. Ugh. He sure is willing to get all the perks, but then want to talk bad about it. Ugh, I don't like him. I don't like him one bit. I can put Ramsey in the same bucket I put Stephen over there. I know some of y'all don't believe it, but that's how I think. That's how I think. They over here having sex without no condom. <laughs> they better put one on. Just like, just like Marissa said, she not getting on no birth control. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. She going to not get on. You know why? Because she's just like the man in a relationship. How many men, women have been in a relationship with a man just like Ramsey saying, I don't want to wear no condom because I can't enjoy it. And what happens is the women have to bend and accommodate the man too. They have to be the one that goes on birth control because the man is saying they don't want to wear a condom. That's what Ramsey is saying. See, Ramsey is this mix, right? He want to pull the man card sometimes and then other times he wants to pull the female card. And so does Marissa. She want to pull a man card and then she want to pull a female card. And on this birth control stuff, Marissa want to pull the man card. The man card is, it's not my duty to do anything about birth control. That's your job as the female. And she putting the work on Ramsey's. These two, I really don't know who they should be with. I really don't know. Like I said, I don't know if it's heterosexual. I don't know. I'm, I'm not up on today's titles. You know, all these titles they got. They got so many of them. But he, she, they, um, they probably need to be with they's. Let me just say that. They probably don't need to be with he's or she's. They probably need to be with some they's. That's all I probably can say. Other than that, I don't know. I really don't know. And then we're going to move over here to Tim and Alex. And I really thought it was going to be the end last time. When episode six finished, y'all, I thought it was going to be the end. But we find out it was not the end. It wasn't the end. These two are still hanging tough. Tim came back. Tim came back. I guess I was wrong about Tim. I might have been wrong. I might have to admit that I was wrong about Tim and that he isn't as bad as I thought. That he is not as bad as I thought he was. But I guess we're not wrong about Alex because Alex is a hot, hot mess. So he came back, he said, um, and what she said was um, she didn't know that he would be all that upset with what went down in Mexico. Which tells me that whatever she did... She didn't think it was that it was as big as what he said it was. The fact that she called him out his name, the fact that she put her hand on his mouth tells us that what in Alex's world, that's not that big of a deal because why should he be that upset about what I did? That, that tells me that there's something wrong with Alex. She doesn't even think what she did was that big of a deal because she doesn't think that his reaction to it should have been as big as what it was, which means for her, Calling someone out her name or putting her, putting her hand over someone's mouth is that not that big of a deal? I mean, I'm trying to think of my own marriage. If I was reaching to put my hand over my husband's mouth, I guarantee you, my husband would have caught my hand. He would have caught my hand. You ain't got, ain't no way my hand would get that close to my husband. <laughs> uh, that would never even happen. So I don't even know how she got that far with Tim. I really don't even know how it happened. Maybe my husband just got good reflexes because I'm going to tell you. I don't, I, I don't know. How does that happen? But he said he want to keep exploring the relationship. He said he wants, you know, he wants to continue to have her as her fiance. And hopefully, you know, they can have a family. He wants to go on and meet her dad, which he goes on to do. and makes a very good impression. And they want to build a new bridge to start a new life together. And it's exciting to go back. We come to find out that, you know, what they're going to do about dinner. And he's like, well, you know, we could just door dash it because Ashley's saying she don't like to cook. And we find out Ashley don't like to cook nor clean. I mean, some of these women these days, they're not even trying to do 50-50 on cleaning and cooking. I'm all for, you know, breaking down the patriarchal roles in society. But a lot of women have gone from doing all the cooking and all the cleaning to doing none of it. They, and we come to find Alex ain't even cleaning up after herself. Forget cleaning up after a husband or a man. You can't even clean up after yourself. 
So what's going to happen when you have children in the very beginning when the kids don't even know how to clean up after themselves and you do got to clean up after them? And then how are you going to teach your kids how to clean up when you don't know how to clean up? I guess it's going to have to be the Navy man because I know the Navy man knows how to clean up. Ain't no way you can do eight years in the Navy and not know how to be clean. And we come to find out, you see his house, his house is organized. How the hell is Tim going to overlook all this stuff with athlete? She's violent. She got a foul mouth. She talks back. She's sarcastic. Now she's dirty, don't clean, and she don't cook. This ain't going to go nowhere. This can't go nowhere. This can't go anywhere. Maybe Tim just doesn't want to look like the bad guy right now. I think Tim doesn't want to come off and look like the bad guy. But then when I saw that speech he gave to that daddy, and I thought, dang, you doing all this in front of the daddy? And you, are you going to say no at the altar after doing all this with the daddy? And, uh, you know... Alex is over here saying, you know what? You're going to have to do a lot to impress my father. There's a lot you're going to have to do. She's so afraid what her father's going to think. Um, and she's prepping him and telling him, when you meet my dad, this is what I want you to do. Then we're going to go outside and then you have a conversation alone with him. And then you got to have a speech and then you have to do this. She's really coaxing him because in a lot of ways, I, she's really afraid of what the dad is going to say. And so when we see the family, when we see the dad who has MS. And um, she said, I think before she had told us that her mom had, had MS, her biological mom did too. But I don't see that with the biological mom because we saw the mom there and they were talking about how the biological mom and the father hadn't seen each other for a long time. But it's quite clear that uh, the father's MS is much more further along. I might have got these MS stories. I knew there was a mother and a father who had MS was it her stepmother or was it the stepfather and the stepmother? I don't know. But her father is definitely further along in his MS. He has some speech impediment, impairment that's he's going on. But he still had that sort of critical personality, which probably maybe when he had all his faculties, maybe he was leaving up a bit more stern, right? So imagine a man, he was a bit more stern in the beginning. But he softened up to Tim. He liked Tim. Once Tim told his story, talked about being in the military for eight years, talked about what he does now. And he has a home. He has all these things in place that could build a home with Alex. His father became impressed and said, you know what? This is good for my daughter. This is good for my daughter because he probably know his daughter too. And um, the brothers were there. The brothers were talking about how Alex is sort of like has maternal instincts because she's so bossy she's so bossy we know that about her she's so bossy maybe tim likes this i just don't know y'all i'm just so confused when it comes to tim and alex i'm really really confused on i don't know if tim really does like this like i said um one of the things i said about tim before is that he dives in he dives out he doesn't stick that in the beginning he really goes in and I'm starting to think that I don't know if I was wrong about the total thing about Tim, that he doesn't look at things very well and really all the pros and cons. So when he gets in there, he doesn't want to stick in there too long. I'm still thinking that in the end, he's going to leave. He's going to leave Alex. When is it going to happen? I don't know, because part of his M.O., I think, is getting places. Once he's there, he surveys the land and looks at it. He decides he really doesn't like it and he leaves. And there's something about Alex that right now he hasn't, he hasn't finished his surveying of the land. But once he finishes the survey of the land, he's going to leave. And maybe there's another part of Tim that doesn't see it right away. Like maybe other people see all of the pitfalls of what he's doing, but he doesn't. Like I bet there are friends who could have told him, Alex, you're not going to fit well with the military because you got this type of personality. But he said, no, I can do it. I can do it. And then he got to the military and realized, yeah, my friends were right. Just like he said, he didn't really think he was a school person. He didn't like college. He didn't like studying. And he didn't, but he, then he went to college. I bet there were people who said, Tim, I don't know if you're really going to like college because you don't seem like the person who's going to fit well in with college. He goes, yeah, I can do it. I'm going to go anyway. And then he ended up leaving. I feel that with Alex. Like he's going to say, people are going to say, I don't really think Alex is the person for you. I'm saying it. Probably there are a lot of people out here saying, Alex, I don't think 
Tim, I don't think Alex is the woman for you. He's going to say, no, I think I can make it. I think it can work. He's going to go ahead and go ahead with Alex. And then he's going to say, oh, yeah, she's not the woman for me. That's what I think is going to do, because it's pretty clear that these two shouldn't be together. For me, it's really clear that they shouldn't be together. Um, and Alex needs some help. Alex is a hoarder. Alex is a hoarder. Now, she want to say that she, when she went back to that house and said, I was packing for this trip and I didn't have chances to put things away. No, girl. No. What you were trying to do is you were trying to clean up your apartment before you knew he'd come home and see it, but you didn't make it through it. And all the, as far as you got was putting things in trash bags and leaving them in the house. She's a hoarder. She couldn't get rid of it. And because her brain couldn't, couldn't let go of anything, she just left it all right where it is. And the reason why I know she's a hoarder is because what she also said was, I know my place is really junky, but I feel really at peace right here on this couch. She sat on that couch in the middle of that junky, dirty house and said she was at peace. Alex likes chaos. She likes chaos. And that's why she's comfortable with all the chaos that she's having with Tim. Like, he, like she said, she didn't think it was that big of a deal. She didn't think, why is he so upset about this? Because things that will put most people on alarm in terms of chaos and disorder and conflict, for Alex, is actually comfortable for her. It's where she wants to be. Her house is chaotic. Her house has a lot of conflict in it. That house is screaming and yelling when you walk into it. These clothes are screaming and yelling. These, this trash is screaming and yelling. But yes, she says she can sit on the couch and she feels comfortable with it. She can scream and yell and do things with, without Tim and it's not a problem for her. It's not a problem for her at all. She's comfortable in mess. She's comfortable in chaos. Alex is where she wants to be and as long as Tim can accept it, she will stay there. But Tim isn't going to be able to be comfortable in all that chaos. He's not going to be able to be comfortable. He's going to try to be. He's going to try to be at first. He's going to realize I can't live like this. Alex is dirty. She's a hoarder. And most people are hoarders. It's a sign of another issue going on mentally. Mentally. Man. We talk about change of events. This was another one. Wow, 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 wow. I don't see these two making it. I really don't see these two making it. And then we got to talk about Hannah and Nick. Hannah and Nick. And we come to find out that uh, Nick is just a dumb jock. Nick is just a dumb jock who lives at home, who's lived a posh life. It looks like Nick has never even lived outside his mama's house, to be honest with you. It looks like he's never lived outside his mama's house. All he moved was from the top floor to the bottom floor in the basement. And um, Hannah don't like that even more because they have lived opposite lives. Here was Nick living a posh life with a very loving and kind mother who really just accepts Nick for whatever he is. He lives in the top house. He don't move down to the basement apartment. Uh, dotes on him, still cooks for him, still does everything for him. Um, probably washes his clothes because she's a Cuban mama. We find out she Cuban. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if that mama's still doing his laundry. Um, and you got Hannah over here who grew up with a mama who's critical. Remember, Hannah's mama locked up the snacks because she didn't want Hannah to get fat. We finally see the mama. The mama's not too ashamed of telling Hannah about herself. It's always interesting to see a mother criticize their daughter in front of their daughter's new mate. I always find that interesting but not in a good way not in a good way and I noticed that about their about her mother now I see why Hannah felt the way she did about her body she definitely has a body complex a look complex because it did come from that mother early on because even when she saw her mother on this episode she was oh you sure look hot mom and I thought that was another little sign that Hannah told her mother she looked hot because she probably knows her mother likes those type of compliments along the way it's nothing wrong with calling your mother hot but i to me i felt like it was a special thing going on with that and i mean the mother's older her mother's attractive but i imagine when the mother was younger maybe she was even more hot as a younger woman right and maybe there was this sort of feeling of she put on hannah as hannah was growing up 
I could see that dynamic going on with them. But there, I could also see how there's this part of Hannah that could be jealous of Nick because Nick had the life that Hannah didn't have. Hannah talks a lot about how she grew up, that her parents de-supported her when she turned 18. She'd been working since she was 15 years old. That's quite a bit different from Nick's life where here Nick is 30-something years old and he's still supported by his mother. Hannah's going to fall in love with Nick's mother. Hannah's going to fall in love with Nick's mother. I'm going to say it again. And Hannah is going to become closer even to Nick's mother than she, than, she is, than she is to her own mother. Because the type of love that Nick's mother gives is the type of love and acceptance that Hannah wants. Hannah actually wants. Um, to be honest with you, between Hannah and Nick, will they be together? I don't know. But there's a part of me, y'all, I know it's going to sound weird, where I can actually see them being together. I actually can see Hannah saying yes to Nick. I know she puts him down a lot. She really talks bad about him, talks, makes, you know, jokes about how he can't boil pasta, which he can't, which was crazy. That whole scene was crazy. Not only was it crazy that Nick doesn't know how to boil pasta. I thought it was crazy that Hannah was in the kitchen cooking in a, a leather or a fake leather jacket. <laughs> Pleather. Girl, you're going you gonna to burn yourself up. <laughs> I thought that was such a weird scene that she came in in a pleather leather jacket cooking and he can't even boil water. It was all just so very, very weird. They're both adventurous people. They both went off and jumped, did that whole bungee jump thing. I thought that was like wild. I used to want to bungee jump. It was, used to be on my bucket list years ago. It ain't on there no more. Once I really talked to people who bungee jump, and they all said they would never do it again. After that, I was like, okay, that's good. I don't need to do it. They go, yeah, it was on my list. I did it, but it's something I'll never do again. Everyone said the same thing. And even on this one, Nick said he'll never do it. But the way that Hannah talks about Nick and tells Nick how she's smarter than him, she's more emotionally intelligent than him, she can do everything better than him. <laughs> she loved to put this man down. She loved to put this man down. But it's secretly, I think she likes the role. Hannah likes to have the one up on Nick because it makes her feel in control. She talks about him negatively. She starts talking about all these stocks in mind. You don't know what stocks are. You don't know what bonds are. You don't, I'm more financially savvy than you. This girl, she was putting him down a lot. And, but yet in another way, she wasn't saying she didn't want to be with him. What she was saying was, I'm going to teach him a lot. She wasn't saying that I see all these things about him I don't like. And so therefore I don't want to be with him. What she was kind of getting to was like her list. Remember the list she did in Mexico? She was writing down the list of all the things she's going to have to teach him. I don't think Hannah's planning on leaving Nick. I think she's planning on teaching him. I think she's planning on being his boss, being his mama. That's what I think she's planning on doing. But the problem is that Nick's not used to a woman like that. He is used to a woman doing everything for him, right? Like his mom is. But he's not used to that mother also being so critical of him. He's used to the woman being accepting of him. So in one way, Hannah's going to look at it as like, oh, I'm kind of like his mother because his, mo his mother is more like an in-charge person, probably running a lot of things. But yet his mother doesn't have that critical tone and voice that Hannah does. And I think that's where she's underestimating Nick. She sees that he's the type of man that is going to let her lead, right? But she's thinking that, She's, he's going to let her lead and have this critical voice and those two don't go together, right? Nick probably wants more, a, a woman more like his mother who is willing to lead and take care of a lot of stuff but also not be critical because even Nick's father said that the mother taught him a lot which tells me that the mother's role in that family has been a leader in his family but she's also nurturing. So a woman that is a leader but is also very nurturing. And what, and what um, Hannah is trying to be, she's trying to be a leader, but she's not nurturing. She puts people down. And that's not the same thing. When you started looking at Hannah cleaning that house, she done burned a whole tree with all that paper towel, cleaning everything with paper towels, the counter. She started talking about her cleaning schedule. I need you to take out the trash without me asking for it. Uh, do your own laundry, do my laundry, vacuum every two weeks. No, vacuum every day. He talked about he only vacuum every two weeks. 
sweep every day. Um, at first I was, at first I was, I was with Hannah, but when she started talking about cleaning walls and baseboards every week, I was like, girl, okay, you don't gone too far, Hannah. You don't gone too far. <laughs> baseboards, you cleaning baseboards every single week. Everything I was with you on. But when she got to cleaning, scrubbing all the walls in the house and the baseboards every week, what for? How dirty are your hands? Are you really getting your walls that dirty every week? And then she said she spent $300 a week on groceries, on paper towels. <laughs> I know she spent $300 on paper towels, but maybe not groceries. What is she talking about? Nick D was like $300 on groceries. We don't need to spend that money. She goes, oh, yes, we do. And you're going to have to pay half. You're going to have to pay half. Girl, Nick D is a realtor probably only selling a couple houses a year because he don't pay no rent at home. He just told you he does not pay rent at home. He lives at home. He does not pay rent. He don't need to sell but one or two houses a year. So what you're going to have, Hannah, is you're going to have a man that doesn't make any money but yet he's also not going to be able to pay any bills and he don't know how to do no housework. Nick D has is becoming a useless jock. His mama didn't his mama didn't do him no favors. I know his mama loved on him his whole life, but his mama didn't do him no favors. Nick D is out here in the world, probably ain't got no skill, no talent, can't clean, can't cook, can't make no decisions, can't make no financial decisions. He's a child. He is a 28-year-old child, and I don't know what type of woman is going to want to take on the responsibilities of Nick D. But ironically enough, I believe Hannah thinks she is going to be able to do it. I kind of think she thinks she's going to be able to do it, y'all. I think she's going to be able to think she's going to be able to run Nick D. Because when she's over here talking about Nick D to everybody and telling everybody about him and how he can't do nothing to who he is, she's kind of like low-key bragging. Even when she was talking to Nick D's mother, she was low key bragging about this is Nick, but this is who I am. It's just like we saw her in the pause. She does like to compete. She likes to elevate. She likes to be top dog. So when most people would be mad at the position that she's in with Nick D. They wouldn't want a Nick D. But in a lot of ways, it, like, it makes Hannah feel better about herself. She can brag on herself. Just like she was saying how, how beautiful she is, how she's a 10. Now she's talking about how financially savvy she is, how clean she is. She think a whole, she think whole, a, a, a highly about herself. Even her brother had to say that is her problem. She can dish it, but she can't take you. She could talk about you like a dog, dish it out, but the minute you flip it on her, she can't take it. She can't take it. She running like a scared little puppy in the corner with her tail tucked behind her head. She can dish it, but she can't take it. If Nick D ever turned around on her even half of the stuff a 10 percent of the stuff she turns on him she will crumble like a lay's potato chip she can't take no punches she can throw a lot of punches but she can't take any but she won that family over a whole whole lot she won them over that mama loved her that daddy loved her everybody loved her they saw at the end of that little dinner they were like we'll take you over nick and um this ain't good long term. This is not good long term. And I don't think that Nick is going to end up choosing her because um, she's going to like to run him too much. But I actually can see Hannah saying yes to Nick. Because even though she's complaining about her role, she low key, she low key um, bragging about it. Low key bragging about it. And now we got to get to the last couple. I saved them for last because of the biggest heartbreak of all. And that's Ashley and Taylor. Or Ashley and Tyler. And they start off in Mexico. They last little group trip together. They roll them mean camels. I already told y'all, don't ride no camels. They mean. That's why they got to put that guard on their mouth. Because they'll bite you. They'll bite you. I'm telling camels are mean. Camels are mean. And like they said, it ain't even a smooth ride. But, you know, everybody do it for yourself. Do it for yourself. Don't be listening to me. Try everything for yourself. And um, they started talking to everyone about. They started talking to each other about their traditions and what they did for christmas and uh, we, we need to talk about this because this is going to set up for the big old bomb lie that we find out with tyler later on and they started talking about what did, what did you do for christmas last year and he said that he stayed home for christmas and she said oh so did i 
and that they both cook by themselves. But they want to start their own traditions for Christmas. Yeah, let's make an ornament. Yeah, let's do this. Yeah, let's do that. So here he is talking about Christmas, talking about kids, you know, um, what we're going to name our kids. They're making deals. Okay, you get to name the boy. I get to name the girl. This whole time, Tyler ain't tell this girl nothing about whether or not, told, he ain't told this girl nothing that he already done named some kids. Well, he may not have named no kids because as he says, he just donate the sperm. But we find out later on, it's a quite a bit more than donating sperm. And, and Ashley is calling it a, a sperm donor, but we find out it's more than a, sp a sperm donor. Um, it ain't like he went to a sperm bank and don donated his sperm and then some random women out there are using it. We find out that, no, you know the women. These are your kids. You're involved in the kid's life. It's, it's quite a bit, y'all. It's quite a bit. Um, but here they are praying in bed. Praying in bed, he's saying a prayer for her, praying a prayer for the family. I really want to hone in on all these things that um, Tyler is doing because it's a lot to reconcile. Because what we're going to find out and what we know now is that Tyler has told a really big lie over here, a really big lie. And now you have to look at everything that he has said and you, start, you have to start reconciling what he said over here versus this part over here. You have to start thinking about, are these prayers lies? The things you say in the prayer, are they lies? The way you pray over Ashley, which is all, it's been so sweet and so kind and so heartfelt are all these lies. I will say this about Tyler. There was one part, I don't know if y'all remember, it was a part a couple of episodes ago when Tyler said, when we get back to D.C., there are going to be people who say things, negative things, but I want you to know that I'm not that person anymore. And Ashley said, well, there's not going to be no one saying negative things about me. And he said, no negative things? She says, no. And he said, but he was kind of giving her a warning that there are going to be people who, who say negative things about him, but he wanted her to not know that those things weren't the case anymore. And that was when Tyler said, um, and that was when Ashley said, it doesn't matter what anyone says about you. I'm a ride with you. And she said to him, even if my mom doesn't like you, I'm still going to choose you. And then I remember in this episode when uh, she met the father. And the father said, she's a ride or die chick. She's a ride or die chick. And what I want to tell you guys right now is I think, that Ashley is still going to say yes to Tyler. We come to find out on this show that he has three kids that he said he was a sperm donor. Or he, actually, he actually, actually used the words sperm donor. He probably told her I donated the sperm, but he told her I still know the women. And I don't know if the women that he donated the sperm to or the couple is a gay couple. I have no idea the circumstances. If it is a, a gay couple that wanted kids. Um, and then he said he had three children. But he didn't say if all of those three children were together with the same couple. Or did he donate sperm to three different couples? Like are all those three kids one family unit? Or are there one, one kid over here, one kid over here, one kid over here? Or is it two over here, one over here? We still don't know that. Like Ashley said, we ain't seen no paperwork. We don't know all the circumstances surrounded around it. But we know that he lied about it and he hid it from Ashley from the very beginning. In a lot of worlds, what we say is what, what he did was he love bombed Ashley. Because he did move fast. He, he did everything right. Um, it was just so perfect and wonderful. And I just love them as a couple. I really, really want them to work out. And he made her fall in love with him. And he waited to hold the biggest bomb to later, which is, I got these three kids. And now he's a big fat liar. But I want to go back before the lie, y'all. Because I want to know who is Tyler. Um, he sat over there with that dad once again. And asked for Tyler's hand in marriage. 
and the dad started crying and he talked about once again how much he's going to love on Tyler and once again how much he's going to love on Ashley and the father telling her that she's the total package she's brain she's beauty she's everything and um Right now, we also find out they're not even using protection. Another couple not using protection. I don't know what method they're using, the pull-out method, because even Ashley said she doesn't want to get pregnant before marriage, and they need to be careful, because obviously they're not using condoms, and they must be using the pull-out method. But we also find out that who, what made Tyler do this with these women? So I need y'all to go back to in the mindset of a man who is single with no children, who says, I'm willing to give my sperm to these people, a woman, maybe it's one woman or two women. We don't know because we still don't know how many women have his sperm. He's got three kids, but is that three women? What made him do this? Um, I, I think it was something that he did without a lot of thought one thing that i do believe with tyler is that he's a person who wears his heart on his sleeve the part that i don't i still believe about tyler is he's a very emotional person that he moves with his emotions and that he may be a person that moves with the, his emotions very fast because he fell in love with ashley very fast which means his emotions rule him a lot so here's a man that before he had children, before he donated his sperm, someone had to come to him or give him the story that, hey, we want to have children, but we don't have a male for any sperm. And they had to tug on his heartstrings. And so what they did was they tugged on those emotional parts of him and he decided, I'll give you my sperm. Why did he do that? Why would a man agree to do that? Because we're not talking about the traditional way you donate sperm where now you don't have anything to do with the children because he's such an emotional person i don't think tyler ever wanted to be the person who gives the sperm and not to have anything to do with the children because i think tyler is a very emotional being i think he knew that once i give my sperm i'm going to want to be involved in the children's life that's what i think i think that he probably did want to have children and maybe he didn't, he couldn't find the woman he wanted to have children with. And he looked at this as a way to have family that he didn't have. Tyler talks a lot about not having family. And I think what he looked at this was in the beginning was he wanted family so bad, but yet he didn't have the woman that what he did was he created this family. If you look at it, he does a lot what even some women will do. Some women will say, I couldn't find the man that I wanted to marry, but I wanted a child. So what I did was I just got pregnant by a man. I know y'all don't want to look at it this way, but there are a lot of women who want children who haven't found a man. And what they do is they go out and they just have a baby by a man. And later on, they call that man a sperm donor because what they wanted was the baby. What they wanted was the family. They wanted their own family. And they got it through that child. And it wasn't so much about the woman. I mean, it wasn't so much about the man. What you have is Tyler, who's a very emotional person, who I suspect wanted a family very bad. And what he decided to do was to do what a lot of women do. He decided to have a baby with women so he could have a family. That's why he's still in that, those kids' lives, because that's really what he wanted. He wanted a family. Um, and for him, he probably felt that was the safest way to have babies because at least I'm not having a baby with a woman who I'm now going to have all these complete responsibility because you have, it's a different situation. It's a different situation between having a baby with a woman, knowing you really don't want to be with her versus saying, if I have it with a woman, a gay couple, there could be a different dynamic. Um, Tyler wanted a family. So when he did this sperm donation to these women or women, the woman or women, he did it purposely to have children. This is why I think that Ashley's going to stay with Tyler. 
Because when he, when we finally saw the scene with it dropping on him, I could already see that Ashley was worked her, working her way through it. Um, she's overlooking the lie he told because he did tell a lie. He told a lie. He didn't tell her. Um, but in the context of lying about children, a lot of people do it. A lot of people meet people and they don't tell each other that they've got children. I know that there are women listening to me right now that they didn't find about, out about a man's children until two or three months into a relationship. And then even once they found out, they still stayed with him. And this is all moving really fast. I think it was foul that Tyler did it. I think it was heartbreak, heartbreaking that he did it. Um, but I'm trying to keep my rational head together here and not get too caught up in just the lie because the lie itself is horrible. It makes me think, what else did you lie about? It is definitely reason to pause for Ashley. Um, so I don't know if she will say yes to Tyler, but I'm thinking that she will. When Ashley came back and they're sitting on that couch, one thing I noticed is Ashley still had her ring on. And Ashley wasn't, she was upset and she was hurt and she was crying, but she didn't take that ring off. She didn't give it back to him. In the end, she hugged him and told him that she, that she loved him. And what she was also asking for was for more information. The fact that she was asking for more information says she was still open. She didn't close the door. And, um, what she's going to say is to herself, this man has everything that I want. He's everything I ever wanted in a man because that's what we saw. But he lied to me about these children and he actually has three children. And what, what he really is in the world is he's a man that has three kids, just like if he were a man that was divorced with three children. That's who he is. He did not say that who, that's who he is in the world, but who he really is. It doesn't really matter if he had the children with you know, a gay couple or what. He's really just a man that has three children. And women meet men out here in the world all the time that have three children. And what Ashley's going to say to herself is, here's a man that has three children, but is he like a man that has three children with an ex-wife or a man that has three children with three baby mamas? She's going to say in a little bit of a kind of way, this is a better deal for me. If I have to date a man with children, which we don't even know if Ashley is used to dating men with children. If I have to date a man with children, is this a scenario where I would like the most? Because in a lot of ways, I'm not going to have no baby mama drama. And in a lot of ways, I get to see how he shows up in the world as a father right now. And for whatever, and what we see out here in the blogs, I've seen a couple of the blogs. He's an active father. He's an active father in these children's lives. And that's going to be endearing to Ashley. Even, in, even Ashley said in her own words, it's not so much about the kids and that you donated sperm. That in and of itself is admirable. She actually admires what he did. And I believe that once he starts telling his real story of why he did it in the first place, why he really did in the first place. And I think it was because he was lonely and he wanted a family. And he did exactly what a lot of women do is they create a family for themselves, even though they're not married to the people. I think Ashley's going to view him differently. I think, and then she's going to, and then she's going to rationalize the way, the reason he didn't tell her. And he's going to tell her the reason why I didn't tell you is because I knew that if I told you, you wouldn't have been with me. It's a lie that made her fall in love with him. It really is a lie. It really is a lie. And she's going to have to figure out, well, is this symptomatic of all the lies you would tell me going forward? Because this is a big, big lie. It's a big, is this a sign that you are a liar in general? Or is this a lie because you just lied to me because you knew I would say no to you and you really wanted this? Right? You really wanted this. He's no different than a lot of people who lie about having children or decide to tell men or women about their children later on in the relationship. Typically women can't hide their children because they have the children all the time. Men hide children all the time. So let's not try to pretend men don't hide children out here in the world, people. Let's not try to pretend that. Tyler's moving like a lot of men move. Let's be honest about that. I'm very shook on this. 
I'm very, very shook, y'all. But right now, I'm going to go ahead and watch these other episodes. I don't know how many more episodes we have left. But if I had to put my money on anything right now, right here today, I'm going to lean towards that Ashley's going to say yes to Tyler. Because if Tyler's any real stories, anything close to what I just said, she's going to still say yes. Because it was too many things about Tyler that Ashley liked. It's too many things. If she was on the bubble with, with, with Tyler, and then this would have just put her over the edge and it would have been a no. If, if she was still unsure about Tyler, this would have probably put her in the no category. But right now, it's still one loss. It might have been the biggest loss of all, like a, a big game, a Super Bowl. But I think that they were really in love. I think they are really in love. I don't think it was fake. And I think Ashley represents what Tyler has really wanted all along is a family. And when he was sitting there and he was lying to her and he was lying to her about having kids, even though he had kids in his mind, he wasn't really lying because what he was describing was the life he really wants. And even though he already has children, he doesn't get to do all those other things that you do with a family. And he didn't say that, though. But what I think he was realized when he had these children was that once he had children with these women, you know, the, the couples that can have children, he started to realize that, no, even though I had these children with you, I still want the family unit now. It's just like a woman who has a child with a man. I have a child. I got what I wanted. But now I want the family unit and the family unit he wants is I want the children again, but I want it with Ashley. I want the wife. I want the kids. I want the whole thing. It's no more that I just want the child. I do want the husband. I do want the wife. And I think in Tyler's mind, when he was sitting there and lying all this time and he was dreaming about the life he would have with Ashley in his mind, he really was, he really was describing a completely different life. Because although he has children, it's not the life he's saying he wants with Ashley, but he lied about it. He lied about it. But I think once they get behind closed doors and they talk about it, and if Tyler explains it to Ashley the way I'm talking about it right here, and she really hears about it, I think she's going to forgive the lie and she's going to move forward. And she's going to be, she's going to reframe it in her head. I know I got an unpopular opinion. I know I got an unpopular opinion, but that's what I see happening. But we'll see y'all. But anyway, that's it, y'all. That's all we got. Don't forget to like the video. Don't forget to subscribe. And don't forget to uh, drop a comment down in um, the comment section. And I will talk to you later. Bye. Yeah.